Hi, this is Tony Mormino with Insight Partners, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast, where, where we work to give back to the HVAC community by sharing our HVAC application and design experience. So in this live recording of episode 26, we're going to discuss the upcoming Fortin A phase down and transition to alternate refrigerants. And we'll get started here in just a just a few minutes. So we got a countdown timer here. We're going to get started in about four minutes, which should be about 11.03, 11.02 Eastern time. So thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Tony Mormino, and I'm the marketing director here at um, Insight Partners. We're an HVAC rep firm in the Southeast, and uh, we're so glad you're here joining us. I am physically located in Marshall, North Carolina, which is about 30 minutes north of Asheville, um, North Carolina, up here in the mountains. It's a kind of a rainy, cool day here today, but um, you know, thankful we have this high-speed internet that we get to do this. Uh, we get to do this with you folks um, um, live, so it's a lot of fun. And thank you so much for joining us. We've had a ton of fun uh, using these new these new online tools to reach our customers. I'd love to hear where you are from. So if you're watching and want to put in the chat where you're from, we'd love to hear it. We we get visitors from all over the the world into our show and uh, it's so cool super fun to know where where you guys are so um again tony mormino with insight partners hey andy yeah we love this area too it's really pretty up here we moved here about uh four years ago i started my hvac career in jacksonville in jacksonville florida but we moved up here a couple years ago we really do like it thank you for commenting and we have a new york city user christopher is in Virginia. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Ned Jennings in Raleigh. Ned, how are you? Steve in Atlanta. Steve, welcome. We have William in Milford, New Hampshire. Welcome to you as well. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Andy, get that countdown going here. Uh, Ralph, let's see here in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you for joining us, Travis from Boston, Pennsylvania, Terry from Pennsylvania. These names are coming in. So if I miss you, I apologize, but uh, we're so glad you're here. Cam, Vancouver, Canada, or British Columbia. Thank you. Which is Canada, downtown Atlanta, Sega. Good to meet you. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. David uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania. We have Eric in Pennsylvania. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is super cool. We really love these, these LinkedIn lines or lives. We're actually streaming it on LinkedIn, and our YouTube channel, HVAC TV. Um, and we're so glad you're here. Hi, Heather. Heather's in Mooresville, North Carolina. Thank you. Heather's a new, I had to get a new grandbaby and she's taking care of a two-year-old. So prayers go out to um, Heather for taking care of her grandson, which I, or granddaughter, which I believe is two. So um, let me see who else. Tom Anderson, Asheville. What's up, Tom? My homeboy, Tom over there. John in Cleveland, Brett in Durham. Uh, Jason and Charlotte, Steve Clank, the one and only Steve Clankson in, in Charlotte, Sean McConnell, next office over. What's up, Sean? I'm high-fiving you through the wall. Um, Sean's going to, if you see Sean poking his head in behind me, it's because something's gone terribly wrong and I didn't, and I don't realize it. Sometimes when you're live streaming, you don't know, you cannot hear me and I, <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. So someone's got a text here tell me. Jose, Roberto, Russell. Joseph, thank you all for joining us. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. It should be pretty cool, a pretty cool short show. And um, please ask questions. I've got hopefully some expert work, experts who are going to join us in the chat if they're available. I'm not really sure um, if they are. Anyway, chat your questions irregardless, and I will and I will answer them as best I can um, as we try to learn our way through this very complex and very confusing refrigerant. Uh, transition, I, I must say, um, at least for me anyway. Um, Gabriel in Denver, welcome. Uh, Joseph Winston-Salem, Russell in New York, Roberto Jose, Jeff Greenwald, what's up, Jeff? Dan Myers, Dan in Canton, right over the hill here, um, up in the mountains here. Okay, this is a lot of fun. I could just sit here for an hour and, and say hi to everybody. This is pretty cool, but I think um, we ought to probably move along and try to learn something today. So let me get my bearings here. Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody um, to this. 
I think our first live recording of a podcast, and this is episode 26 of the Engineers HVAC podcast. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing the current state of affairs regarding the 410A phase out and transition to lower GWP refrigerants. There's three points I'm going to touch on here. Uh, the status of the current regulations, uh, the, <laughs> which is a, a very murky mess at best. Um, important milestones for the equipment manufacturing and refrigerant production, which really for us, I think that's what we really need to know. And, uh, and the properties of the two al alternate refrigerants, that's important as well. So this does qualify for PDH credits. I'll put my email here up. I'll put this up and down periodically because I don't want it to cover the, the um, whatchamacallit, the, the graphics I'm trying to show here. So I'll, I'll put that up and down every once in a while. But uh, okay, so where was I? Uh, back to the presentation. This does qualify for PDHs, so please email me after the show. And thank you so much for joining us. And if you're listening to this in the future on our podcast, thank you for listening as well. We do appreciate you. Okay, so um, I wanna first thank some special folks who, who we've reached out to. Again, this has been uh, something I've been trying to learn here in the past, let's say a couple weeks, because I'm trying to get my arms around what's actually going on with the transition. So we've, we've had some help with this. Um, I want to thank Rick Nadu with, um, he's a senior technical uh, services trainer at Samsung and Chandra, he's the regulatory affairs specialist with Samsung. Chris Forth is the VP regulatory codes and environmental affairs at Johnson Controls. And Corey is our regional branch manager at Johnson Controls. Dave Evans is our branch manager at Insight Partners. And I left off Steve Lester here, who's been in a very important resource. He's one of our uh, tech leaders, service technician leaders in the Carolinas. So thank you all so much for your support. Some of these folks may be in the chat, so please ask questions if I can't answer them. I'm hoping one of them will jump in and, and answer them as well. So that'll be pretty cool. Okay. All right, so moving along here. Um, hey, Wendell, good morning. Hey, Scott. Um, okay, so I've been around since 1997 and I've been, this is my third experience with refrigerant transition. So if you remember, if you look back in 96, we were going away from 12, R12, and then in 2010, we phased out of R22 and went to 410A, R410A, which is what the majority of manufacturers use today. Okay. Now we are transitioning to, um, so those two, the first two transitions I mentioned there were basically ODP transmissions. That's ozone depletion. We were trying to get rid of the chlorine in the refrigerant because that attacked the ozone layer. Um, now the new thing is GWP. We want lower, or the world wants lower GWP. Hey, hey, Tom, lower TWP um, refrigerant. So we're going to that, okay? So a little bit about the history. So R12 and R22 were what is called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. And then we went to HCFCs, which are hydro chloral floral carbons and in those elements in those refrigerants is what is chlorine so the chlorine is what attacks the ozone layer okay the ozone is o3 or three three oxygen molecules and the chlorine is what attacks that combination and causes that to break up so that's why we we decrease the chlorine in the refrigerants or that was the the suggested um action so present we have high global warming potential HFCs, such as our 410A and 134A, which, which causes global warming. This is a separate issue. Global warming is where the sun puts the heat into the earth and normally it escapes unless there's gases in the atmosphere, which can trap it in. Too many gases other than what's naturally there can cause the earth's temperature to rise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am by no means going to get in any kind of more detail than that on this. I know this is kind of a touchy thing, but um, anyway, that's the, the theory behind the um, transitions of the refrigerant. So, hey, Scott, good morning to you too. Thank you for joining us. Okay, now I've tried to get online and look at the um, all the regulations that go in to get us when you're here. I would caution you, unless you wanna go down to some eight hour rabbit hole and get very confused, 
I'm going to make it real simple. I've simplified it enough to where I hope that this is accurate. I think it is. I've talked to a lot of experts. So, um, so the Montreal Protocol is kind of where it, this all started, which was a global agreement to protect the ozone layer by phasing out um, production and consumption of ozone depleting sub substances. We talked about that before. The CFCs and the HCFCs fall into that category. Um, and then there was, um, that was in 87. So in 2015 and 2016, the EPA enacted what is called SNAP, Significant New Alternative Policy, which looks at ozone depleting substances and makes recommendations to replace them with alternates. Then there was the Montreal um, Kigali, I hope I'm saying that correctly, I'm not sure if I am, amendment, and I had to look this up because I wasn't really sure what that was, but it's basically a graduate gradual reduction in HFCs in consumption and production, which is where we are now, right? Like we're using HFCs now. Um, so the, what, what's been going on is the world has been moving towards lower GWP refrigerants. The EPA has been very slow in that regard to act. So a lot of the states in the US have made their own regulations, which has made it even more um, confusing. So as of this recording, which is March 10th, the EPA still has not created a final a final rule. They've created something called a proposed rule, which we'll talk about on the equipment transitions. Okay. So what happened is states got tired of waiting. California put its deadline out for the transition of new products. And then we have about 11 or 12 other states in various stages of different regulations that have done the same thing as California. So from 2017 to 2021, since the EPA did not act, certain states like Washington and California said, hey, we're going to have we got climate goals. We can't wait. We're going to do our own thing. Um, from a manufacturer standpoint, you can imagine this is is quite a, uh, a chore because all the different states have different nuances and dates and stuff like that. So, um, so the industry went to the EPA and said, "Hey, can we get this thing going?" So the EPA has now started its regulatory activity, um, which came through something called the AIM Act in 2020 in December. We'll talk about that for a minute, and then we'll see kind of what that's all about. So. Um, the AIM Act, A-I-M, is the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which was passed in Congress in 2020. And um, it gave the EPA the authority to regulate global warming. So before that, the EPA only had authority to regulate the ozone depletion. Um, now the EPA um, can do GWB transitions as well. Um, so the, the AIM Act gave them that authority. So if we go back, we talked a minute. Hey, Ned, how are you? Um, we <laughs> we talked a minute um, about what the states were doing. So here's the California, what they proposed for new equipment. So they proposed their own state, January 1st, 2024, a 750 GWP limit on chillers. In January 1st, 2025, a 750 GWP limit on residential commercial HVAC. In January 1, 2026, a 750 limit on VRF. So that was what California did. So in response to that, and because the manufacturers were really pushing on the um, EPA to do something, they came out with a with a, what's what's called a NOPER, um, which is a notice to proceed um, notice of proposed rule, excuse me. So they came out with that in December 2022, I believe I still have to check on that. But I think that's the date, um, which they basically adopted California's rule, except they went to 700 GP, GWP on the refrigerants as a limit because none of the approved alternates anyway are over 700. So they figured they just go to 700. So here's where it stands from the NOPER, okay, which is the notice of proposed rule. January 1st, 2024, chillers cannot be produced with a GWP over a refrigerant GWP over 700 for Residential and commercial, it's January 1st, 2025. And for um, VRF, it's January 1st, 2026. So these are approved. Um, it is a proposed rule, but it is not, if you ask any experts in the industry, it's not It's not planning on, um, there's not planning on being a change to that. So it's pretty much, as far as the manufacturers I've talked to, they've pretty much uh, considered that set in stone. Okay, so that's for the equipment. now. Here's where it gets a little confusing. I'm going to make this screen a little bigger so y'all can see this chart. Um, so the EPA regulates both supply and demand side. So the supply is the refrigerant 
manufacturers and importers, the demand is the equipment. So the supply side phase down is already finalized. It's not part of the NOPER, that's just for the equipment, okay? So the supply side is already here in this chart and you can see, hey Moon, how are you? And you can see the uh, green line here is the US only. So ignore, you could ignore the other lines and just look at the green ones. Um, so they're doing this through separate regulations and separate timing, and that's where it's getting a bit confusing for the HVAC industry. Um, the green, green line, as we mentioned, is, is the U.S. Note that this is for high GWP HFCs, not just for 410A, okay? So it includes all higher um, GWP HFCs. So in 2020, you can see they reduced production by 10% already, and in 2024 is the next big jump. So that's where manufacturers will have to reduce the manufacturing of, of the refrigerant um, through to 40%. That's 40% total, so it's additional 30% over, over the uh, already 10% that's enacted. So in 2029, we have a 70% reduction. Okay, so it's going pretty, pretty quick. So previously mentioned in 24 and 25, we're just starting the transition of many of the products into the new gases. So the field's going to need a lot of um, 410A, but the production is reduced by 60%. So this could create a potential shortfall. Don't know um, for our 410A and, and beyond. And this is where kind of some of the fear and some of the confusion comes in. So if nothing changes, in which all probability it won't, um, because the manufacturers are, are, are set by the California deadlines anyway, that this is the, the way it's gonna go down. Um, do, 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 experts, okay. Yeah, no one plans on um, any of this stuff changing. So go back to this one here. Okay, so here's a summary. Here's kind of, you know, if you got your phone and want to take a snapshot of this. And by the way, in the upper left corner is a is a QR code to our podcast called the Engineers HVAC Podcast. If you want to listen to that, all of our live recordings, including this one, will be posted there so you can listen to them. You know, fun for the whole family, right? Listen to them on the way to the beach. Okay, so... The EPA NOPER, which is for the equipment side, January 1st, 2024, chillers, January 1st, 2025, residential, commercial, and January 1st, 2026, VRF. So that's the, with all likelihood, going to be the um, restrictions on manufacturing equipment with that type of refrigerant. Um, okay, so the high, w, high GWP refrigerant um, phase down, 40% by 2024 and 70% by 2029. So I'll leave this here for a sec if you want to take a quick snap of this, because I know if you're a consultant, your owners are probably going to start or may have already started asking questions about these these dates here. And we'll do some more um, podcasts on this as well. So. OK, we were on a call a couple of days ago and somebody asked us this great question. So in 2022 or excuse me, when we were phasing out R22, manufacturers were able to build equipment with a nitrogen holding charge and they were able to put um, recovered 22 in the field in the machines. That is not the case at this point. I understand that manufacturers are not allowed to do that in this transition. So I wanted to make a, make a note of that. Okay, so getting rid of 410A, which one do you go to, right? Sorry, I got distracted by comment. Hugh, let me address that here in just a little bit after this this deal. Thank you for the question. Oh, Greg Crumpton's here. Greg's in the house. So Greg Crumpton has a great podcast called um, Straight Out of Crumpton, which is my favorite podcast name ever. I was uh, lucky enough to be a guest down there. Thank you, Greg. And uh, we'll repost that podcast on ours as well. So Greg's gonna looks like he's gonna post some additional info. Thank you very much. Okay, so the two alternatives are 454B. And R32, which one do you go to as a manufacturer? Many things to consider. Oh, I have seen that. Thank you, Greg, for posting that. That is a really nice, uh, well done document. Okay, so which one do you go to? Let's take a look at the differences here. They're both HFCs, by the way. Um, so let's talk about GWP, what it actually is. We talked a little bit about global warming potential. If you see these GWP numbers here, in other words, Fortune A has 2,088. That is the the times, um, so C, they use CO2 as a baseline. So from its global warming potential. So for our Fortune A has 2,088 times more potential um, to trap the 
uh, rays in the in the atmosphere than does CO2. So that's what these numbers mean. Okay, so the lower the number, lower the GWP, the better it is for um, the the climate change or global warming aspect. Um, so many of you have heard about the different types of refrigerants and the R numbers um, for the industry sector. It's really a two horse race between 32 and 454B. Take a look at this chart. It shows the key points, the differences between GWP and ODP and where uh, the demarcation line for GWP is currently being proposed, which is at a 700, um, 700. Please note this reference to CO2. We already did that. Okay. So note the importance that neither candidate is a drop-in replacement. This was a note to me <laughs> that I'm reading out loud. Drop-in replacement for 410A as the new candidates classified by ASHRAE as mildly flammable. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's a big deal, um, or at least the biggest deal as far as going to these refrigerants. We haven't done that before. Um, going lower than 700 GWP could force the industry into hydrocarbons. Um, common hydrocarbon is propane. And I think that would be a huge um, undertaking to do that. So I'm not sure we'd ever get there. But anyway, so 32 and 454B have similar performance to 410A. Both are classified as mildly. Thought I was on the wrong screen there. Okay. Both are classified as mildly flammable. We talked about that. Neither can be considered a drop in. We talked a little bit about that. Um, now let's look at some of the differences. Oh, by the way, a couple of manufacturers have announced which way they're going. A couple have not. Aon, JCI, Carrier, Ream, Nortec are going with 454B. Daikin, Goodman is going with R32. So, okay. Key considerations when determining which refrigeration you're going to use as a manufacturer. Um, safety is always an essential factor. The fact that the two leading candidates are Flammable per ASHRAE 34 makes the transition even more critical. The A2L designation is a relatively new designation for ASHRAE, and it was created specifically to denote the differences between H2, which has high burning velocity, and ignition characteristics. Um, GWP, as we discussed, is the primary driver for the transition, so it'll be interesting to note that R32, besides being a candidate for itself, is also included as one of the components of R454B, which is a blend. Yankee Hu, yeah, Hugh mentioned uh, Daikin makes R32. I forgot about that. So that would make perfect sense why they went to that refrigerant. Um, uh, multiple factors to consider, safety, global warming potential, energy efficiency, capacity, pressure, and availability. Um, so if you look at this chart here, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, um, that basically if you look at the ASHRAE 34 designation, we're gonna talk about that in a minute because that's kind of a big deal, a lot of confusion around that. A1 is what 410A is right now, which is non-flammable. A2L is what is called mildly flammable. We'll look at what that means in a moment. You could see the GWP difference, 2088 versus 466 for 454B and 675 for R32. So 454B has a slightly lower, lower GWP. Um, the component mix, the ratio. So 410A is a 50-50 split of 32 and 125. 454B is a blend of 32 and 1234YF, which I understand is an automotive refrigerant, at a 69% to, to 31% um, ratio. And it's important to note that the R410A and the 454B are what's called near azeotropes, which means they don't have a lot of temperature glide, which means if wh whatever state they're in, they maintain this ratio pretty closely. Okay, so so you can charge currently 410A up to 10% of the unit charge without having to evacuate the system and, and redo it. So um, a little bit to note there. Now R32 is, is not a blend, it's 100% R32. Some of the operating pressures differences, which is important to take into consideration as well. 410A is at 454 PSIA, uh, 454B is at 405, and 32 is at 444. So not a huge difference. It is a little bit lower of a pressure, about 10% lower on the 455, uh, 454B. I believe they all use the same oil too. I'm trying to confirm that. If somebody knows and can throw it in the chat, that would be super terrific. Okay, so a few more things to consider. Um, efficiency wise versus 410A, pretty close. 454B is pretty close. 
there's a little bit of an efficiency gain in R32. As far as 454B, a little lower uh, and capacity is concerned. 454B has a little lower capacity potential per pound and R32 has a little bit more per pound. They're pretty negligible though. I think I'd look these up and they're not that big of a difference, but again, we're still learning as we go here with all the, the new things coming out. Okay, so this is the biggest um, confusion about the flammability. I, we do a lot of social media stuff and there's a lot of stuff out there about having these in our homes and, and our commercial buildings. And so here, here's an attempt to kind of clear up what this actually means, okay? So ASHRAE 34 2002 is what's called the designation and safety classification of refrigerants. Um, it describes a shorthand way of naming refrigerants and assigning safety classifications based on toxicity and flammability data. So A, which you see here, stands for non-toxic, two, means it's flammable and L means it's a low burning velocity. Okay. So 2L is what's called mildly flammable or lowerly flam lower flammability. Lowerly flammable. I can make up. That's a new word. Um, so here's what that means. Let me go back to this jar here real quick. Okay. So A2L is where the new refrigerants fall. The 32 and the 454B, 410A is an A1. Okay. Just so you can see where that falls on the on the chart. So this says it all for me. This was really helpful for me. So this is a snapshot of a test chamber where they actually ignite the refrigerant and they look at the propagation of the flame, which means how much it basically expands and grows as it as it burns. I think they use like a 3000 degree, you know, torch to light these because some of these a the A2s, A2Ls are really hard to ignite. Um, this one right here is a class one or, what's, or what we called an A1 before, 410A with no oil. This is what it looks like in the chamber, okay? And you see these black lines. Um, we've highlighted these yellow ones to show you the outline of the propagation of the flame for 410A. So give you a second to look at that. And next we're gonna look at, you know, what do you imagine the A2L or the mildly flammable looks like in the same chamber? And that's what it looks like here. So you can see it's just a little bit, has a little bit more flame propagation than the 410A, okay? So it really is not that big of a deal. Um, I'll go back to the 410A so you can see it. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about the ignition here in a second. By, by um, comparison, a class three refrigerant which propane is looks like this. Okay, so you can see it's a huge major difference in the flammability. And I'm gonna make this screen a little bigger here. And I'll, I'll just kind of leave these up here for a second. So um, you can see that the difference between the class one and class 2L or the A1 and A2Ls is just a few degrees. Um, the A2Ls like four, such as 454B and 32 have a far less ignition energy than the A3s. Toasters, electric ovens, and other common household products will not ignite the A2Ls. And you could actually go on YouTube. I was going to show one of these videos, but since it's not scientific, I didn't want to show it. But you can see people igniting, trying to ignite the A2L refrigerants. And it's just really, you may get a little puff if it's at extremely high velocity. So um, anyway, that set my mind at ease uh, regarding that. So even the 410A will create a flame under the right conditions, as you can see here, which is extremely hard to create. So safe, safe handling and maintenance practices should be essentially um, the same between uh, A1 and A2Ls. Okay, going back here. And thank you all again for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Um, we got a few more slides here. I'll talk about a few more things. Please throw some questions in the chat if you'd like. And again, just wanted to say thank you. The um, the QR code is, even, is up in the left corner if you want to um, Get connected to our podcast and listen to this scanner share. Okay, so it is important to note that these are the machines that are designed for 454B and R32. They're different machines than the current 410A machines, right? Um, they're going to have different evaporators, different compressors. Uh, the EPA regulations, um, you know, it, you cannot charge a 410A unit with one of these other refrigerants. Okay, it won't work probably, <laughs> not for long anyway. And it, it definitely going to avoid the warranty and it's definitely against EPA regulations. So don't take one of these new refrigerants and drop them into an existing um, existing machine. 
Okay, so what do we do with all this information, right? Um, first of all, don't worry. Uh, my experience is worrying about things we can't control doesn't really help a whole lot anyway. And this is my third refrigerant transition. And I can tell you, it all seems to work out. People are not going to go without their, their air conditioning. And um, so, so don't worry too much about it. Um, currently available availability and pricing. So I asked our service manager for the Carolinas, Steve Lester. Thank you so much. I thought it would be nice to show this. Um, I'm not sure if this is true all over the country, but as of the recording of this, at least in the Carolinas, this is what you would pay as an owner for specific refrigerants. So for R12, which is extremely uh, limited, uh, you can find it, but it's about $132 a pound. Yeah, that's what an owner would pay uh, for the refrigerant. R22 is about $80 to $100 a pound. That is classified as not very available. So I don't know if not very available is as good as, as bad as very limited, but it's it sounds pretty bad. So um, that's just some information R22. 410A is highly available and currently going for $28 um, dollars a pound. Hi, Chandra. Chandra is one of our experts that helps us here, helped us here put this together. A lot of this information is from Chandra and from Chris at JCI and Chandra from um, Samsung Capricia. Uh, building, Chandra says, yes, building codes and equipment design requirements are different for A2L. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Cause uh, yep, in response to a question here, ASHRAE 15 and 15.2 and UL 60355-2-40 have been updated for A2Ls. Thank you, Chandra, for that information. Um, Sam Braddock, hey Sam. Uh, even Sam is asking, even though A2L refrigerants are still difficult to ignite, would you think it possible that fire codes change, which in turns, um, Refrigerant monitors, space servers. I believe Chandra was answering that question. Um, if not, Chandra, if you're still available, can answer that. That would be great. Um, okay, I'm going to move on here. I got a couple more slides, but please keep the questions coming. Got some experts in there to help us with those. Um, so I know a lot of engineers listen to our podcast and watch our shows, consulting engineers. So my, you know, history as a rep um, in the HVAC industry, you know. As we go through these things, owner, you're going to get a lot of questions from owners, right? Which equipment should I use? And at some point, you're going to have to write specifications that if you specify one of the new refrigerants, you might greatly limit your availability, your lead time. Um, it may cause higher pricing. You may not have parts yet. So my, my point to that is, I guess, um, if you're looking at a low GW machine, GWP machine, take in all the different factors, you know, talk to different people, um, look at the lead times of the equipment, the parts availability, the size of the owner's HVAC needs. Is it a develop? Is it the type of owner? Is it a developer? Is it a school, et cetera? The cost of the equipment with the low GWP refrigerant. Also, there's the risk of being first. You know, these are, our manufacturers do a great job of testing, but you know, these are gonna be newer machines with some newer components and newer refrigerants. So there's always a little bit of a risk getting the first one so um the answer to me to an owner to a, an engineer who's talking to an owner would it would be depend on what stage of the transition we were in as to what i would recommend they do for equipment and also get different pricing you know because the 410a machine might be less than the 554b 454b machine etc so that would be my suggestion that and i would say also talk to some trusted uh, resources. And I, I'll tell you, like, it's great to call your account executives that you trust and everything. But one of the industry's most valuable and underused resources are, are, are the guys in the field. You know, if you find a service manager in your area for a local reputable con HVAC contractor, I'd ask that man, ask that person to lunch. Hey, man, can I buy you lunch? I just want to see what's going on. I got this owner. He doesn't know which way to go. Can I get your expert opinion? Because those guys in the field really know this stuff way better than, um, than we do because they got their hands on it all day. So quick shout out to the service techs in our industry. You do a really good job. Um, so what's next? So we're going to continue to provide content, um, updating as we go. Uh, I hope this was a good overview. There's also some contractor and distributor things that need to happen. We will save that for another, another podcast because I honestly am not sure about all that, that end of it. And I'll have to get um, educated on that. So I thank you all so much for joining us. This has been super fun. Um, 
I think we got all the questions in the chat. I'm going to go through here and look for a minute. You're welcome to stay on. But thank you so much. And again, oh, let me put my email up again for PDH credits. If you need PDH credits, this is my email. If you're listening, I'll put the email in the description of the podcast or the YouTube video. Um, it's tmormino at insightusa.com for PDH credits. And let's see what else here. And if you want to hook up with our podcast, again, in the upper left corner, there's a QR code. Feel free to hit that. I see like about 20 people have already hit that. So thank you so much. And thank you for, again, for joining us. And, and we hope that you all have a good day here. Um, and thanks again. We greatly appreciate it. See if I got any more questions here. Uh, what recovery unit will be what recovery unit will be needed to recover refrigerant in small units and large chillers? Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Thank you, Heather. Good luck with the two-year-old. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure about recovery uh, equipment. If somebody is here and can answer that, I'm going to add that to my list. I think that's part of my next upcoming um, slide here. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for joining us, Josh White. Um, Again, I'll stick around here and answer questions if I can. So the recovery side of it, I know in talking to Chandra that, um, thank you, Greg Crumpton. Crumpton, yeah, check out Crumpton's podcast. We appreciate you, Greg. Straight out of Crumpton. I was I couldn't remember the name of it for a second there, but straight out of Crumpton, so check that out. Um, thank you, Greg, appreciate you joining us. Yeah, so um, yeah, the recovery companies are ramping up their production getting ready because we're going to have to really because of the kind of the overlay with the transition with the limit of equipment manufacturing versus the production of you know refrigerant restrictions thank you dan thank you tom yeah um there was a note here that uh, i'm not sure who navac navac is is making a2l compliant machines now yeah aon is one of the products we rep and they're going to start shipping a2l machines later this year so and i'm sure a lot of other manufacturers will probably start doing that as well um yeah so back to the recovery thing so i'm not sure i know a lot of the manufacturers are ramping up their a lot of the folks who make recovery equipment are ramping up their production because recovery is going to be super important because of the the transition the way it's shaken down thank you rami Rami, we appreciate you, buddy. With cha Steve is asking, uh, with changeouts from existing equipment, are are there building construction concerns that the owners have to change any building components? I'm going to take a guess at that and say no. Um, I'm pretty sure the answer to that's no, but I I could be wrong. We're learning a lot of this stuff too. Um, Good article. Thank you, Greg. Greg put a link to an article by um, H A C H R uh, News, which is a great subscription, by the way. I get a lot of our, our information from there. Um, thank you, Hugh. We appreciate that. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and end, end the podcast. Thank you all so much again for joining us, and please look out for the next one. And reach out to me for your PDH credits or you have any